الله بالخير عمران خان رئيس الوزراء الباكستاني السابق أجبر على التنحي عن منصبه في نيسان أبريل الماضي فيما يزعم أنه مؤامرة دبرتها الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية عبر أجهزتها وتحدث عن رسالة سرية من الأمريكيين تطالب بإسقاطه لم تنجح عملية عزل خان عن التأثير السياسي في باكستان اليوم مذاك نجا خان من محاولة اغتيال ويواجه اليوم 77 قضية في المحاكم ومحاولات حثيثة لكتم صوته لماذا تبنى المفكر الأمريكي نعوم تشومسكي عمران خان دون سواه إذا ما ترشح للانتخابات في باكستان من أخرج عمران خان من السلطة ولماذا يحاصر سياسيا وقضائيا وإعلاميا بين الشرق والغرب أين يقف عمران خان اليوم وكيف يقارب المنطقة العربية وقضايا الأمة الإسلامية نرحب بكم ونرى ونسمع أكثر من ضيفنا رئيس الوزراء الباكستاني السابق عمران خان في البعد الأقرب هذه الميادين وأنا زينب الصفار خليكم ويانا If Imran Khan were running, it would take time to vote for him. But I don't know of any other political figure in Pakistan. It seems to be worth devoting much political energy and effort. My general impression is he was making an effort to do some fairly decent things. They were possible criticisms. Uh, I don't think anything happened that justified his expulsion from the political system. Imran Khan is the former Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. He is the founder and chairman of Pakistan Tahrik and Saf Party, PTI, and the former cricket champion who led the Pakistan team to victory in the 1992 Cricket World Cup. Mr. Imran Khan, salam and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is the proximate aspect. I'm Zainab as Safar. So good to have you, sir. My pleasure. Allow me to start, sir, by asking you, the internationally acclaimed uh, American linguist slash philosopher Noam Chomsky's impression about you is, quote, if Imran Khan were running, I will take time to vote for him. I don't think anything happened that justified his expulsion from the political system, unquote. Today, at least 77 court cases have been filed so far against you. Uh, this is the latest update and counting, perhaps. Who is behind these cases? Is there a specific side or person that you can name, sir? Well, we have been uh, taken over by a bunch of criminals. Pakistan, the reason why uh, our economy, which was, uh, which was going through its best performance in 17 years in terms of growth rate and record exports, record agricultural production, uh, record taxes, uh, industrial growth, and, um, uh, and um, IT exports were just improving. So, a country that was going through its uh, best period in 17 years as far as the economy went, despite two years of uh, COVID-19, our government was removed through a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The conspiracy was led by our ex-army chief. Mm -hmm. He combined with these, uh, uh, these two crooked families who had been uh, ruling Pakistan for 30 years, and, and I had replaced them. So he brought them back, mm -hmm. and their 61% of the cabinet was on bail, on corruption cases. So they were imposed on us. And now what has happened is that they're, they're all petrified of elections. Mm -hmm. They know that my party, whenever there are elections, will sweep the elections. Mm -hmm. Out of 37 by-elections since we have been out of power, my party has swept 30 of them. So because they're scared of elections, what they want is they want to have me disqualified or put into prison or even killed. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. 
we treat them as mafias. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why you have 77 cases and every day there is a new case. I have blasphemy case on me. I have uh, sedition case. I have terrorism case. There are three terrorism cases on me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the whole idea is to remove me from the scene. Right. So do you, sir, consider this as a political assassination? How do you confront this arduous situation? And uh, what about the physical assassination? Who wants to liquidate Amran Khan? Give me a name, please. A specific name. Let's specify. Uh, the, uh, the assassination attempt on me was predicted by me. Mm -hmm. Two months earlier, six weeks earlier, on two public rallies, I actually, uh, in the rallies, I announced who, the, uh, who was uh, this attempt on me through a religious uh, attempt. Uh, the decoy was supposedly a religious fanatic, but uh, the people behind them were these two families, these mafias, and one of the intelligence agencies guy, which I named. Mm -hmm. Once I survived the attempt, I named uh, this guy called General uh, Fessel, who is uh, in the uh, ISI and our intelligence agency. And then there's the prime minister and there's the interior minister. Mm -hmm. Both the prime minister and interior minister have been involved in extrajudicial killing. Both of them have blood on their hands. And for them, assassinating an opponent was not going to be anything new. But joining them was this uh, intelligence officer, General um, Fassel. Mm -hmm. These three were responsible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to add to all this, a prohibition order by Pakistan's um, electronic media regulatory authority to ban the broadcast of your speeches slash press talks on Pakistani TV channels. Wow. I mean, why do they fear you that much? Uh, anyways, what is... Uh, sir, your message to the people of Pakistan and to the world as a whole through Al Mayadeen today? Look, uh, they're banning me because they're scared mm -hmm. that we are now going th uh, towards elections. Elections are in 60 days' time, and the Supreme Court has announced election in the two of our provinces, which is 65% of Pakistan. The elections are in, uh, in two months' time. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why they banned me is because they don't want me to campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and why they don't want me to campaign, they are scared. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, as I repeat, out of 37 by-elections where the government had been supported by the government machinery, by the administration, by the establishment, by the election commission, despite and all parties on one side, 13 parties on one side, my party beat all of them in 30 of 37 elections. So they're all scared. Mm -hmm. And that's why they want me out of the way. Let's uh, shift some gears and talk about the foreign policies. Mr. Khan, you have rejected the request of the EU ambassadors to voice an anti-Russian stance vis-a-vis -vis the Russian military operation in Ukraine. How do you see the future of Pakistani-Russian ties and uh, between East and West. Where does Imran Khan stand today, especially with the burgeoning of the China-Pakistan economic corridor? Well, look, first of all, you know, foreign policy is made for the benefit of the people of your country. So national interest means the interest of the people of your country. And foreign policy should protect the interest of your country. So when uh, the European Union uh, ambassadors asked me publicly, which is unprecedented, it's against diplomatic norms, they publicly asked me to condemn the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. I asked them one question, that why did they not ask India to condemn the Russian mm -hmm. invasion, because India is a partner, an ally of the United States in, in what is called the Quad. Mm -hmm. So it's a strategic ally. So why did they not ask India? Why did they ask Pakistan? Mm -hmm. So that was my number one point, which is bizarre. Mm -hmm. I mean, how dare they interfere in our internal politics? Mm -hmm. Secondly, 
my idea of uh, uh, international uh, relations, as I've just said to you before, are the 220 million people of Pakistan. We had negotiated with Russia, just like India, to get discounted oil because after the Ukraine uh, invasion, the price of uh, international oil went up. Mm -hmm. And countries like us suffer when the prices of oil go, go up because it causes inflation, which causes poverty. Sure. So we had negotiated this, uh, this uh, discount. Now, by condemning them, we were jeopardizing this. Mm -hmm. And my third point is that why is it morality selective? for the European ambassadors or for the United States. Exactly. Because when it comes to their interest, mm -hmm. they, do, they do not condemn what is happening in Palestine or what is happening in Kashmir because Israel is their ally and India is their ally. Mm -hmm. But they want us to take positions du uh, double standards, on, on, sir. on international relations, which is their issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's their issue. I mean, the European war is not Pakistan's issue. True. So they want us to take stand there where it can be very costly for our people. Right. On issues pertaining to Pakistan, uh, in a similar vein, definitely the issues of occupied Kashmir and Palestine are thorns in the heart of the Islamic Ummah in their common suffering and atrocities. In your perspective, sir, is there any viable solution for both issues? Uh, Kashmir, the only viable solution is uh, giving them autonomy, independence, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. according to the wishes of the people of Kashmir. This was uh, uh, the world community through the United States, uh, United Nations Security Council resolution mm -hmm. uh, 70 years ago was promised to the people of Kashmir that they will be able to decide their own destiny through self-determination, through plebiscite, True. whether they want to be with India or Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they should be given the right. You can't, you know, use force and you cannot, uh, through the barrel of a gun, keep people enslaved. Mm -hmm. So that is really the only solution. But unfortunately, uh, I, I have no hopes for the current uh, government in, uh, in India, the BJP government. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in Pal uh, uh, the Israel is the same with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. How can you deprive people of their right to live as uh, free, liberated mm -hmm. uh, human beings. So it's the same thing is happening. There is a, unfortunately, mm -hmm. there is this very hard line Israeli governments that just uh, for some reason will not understand that where are the Palestinians going to go? Mm -hmm. And how long will you keep them in prison like that or in, a, in an open prison? You have to give them their rights sooner or later. Otherwise, this problem is not going to go away. But unfortunately, I don't see much logic and reasoning amongst the hardline Israelis. Right. Uh, now, uh, sir, Mr. Khan, Craig Murray, former British ambassador, I'm coming back to your matters internally, tweeted that the CIA's deposing of Imran Khan as prime minister uh, for his opposition to the U.S. drone uh, campaign operating within and from Pakistan is probably the most underreported story of the last couple of years. What is the reason for your categorical refusal, saying absolutely not for establishing U.S. military bases in Pakistan? And how do you see the future of the relationship, perhaps, with Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal and uh, the Afghans breaking uh, the shackles of slavery, as you termed it? Well, look, first of all, the reason why I, I said absolutely not, it's because Pakistan joined the U.S. war on terror. 80,000 Pakistanis were killed. Mm -hmm. There was over $100 billion lost to the economy. We had uh, over 400 drone attacks conducted by the U.S., bombings inside Pakistan, and a lot of the drone attacks killed innocent civilians. And the revenge attacks for the drone attacks were against the Pakistani security forces. Mm -hmm. And what did Pakistan get 
out of this uh, joining the U.S. war in the end. Mm -hmm. We were blamed for playing a double game. Mm -hmm. We were not even given credit for the sacrifices this country made for fighting their war. Mm -hmm. And so my, uh, I'm not anti the U United States. I don't think Pakistan, I think Pakistan should have good relationship with the U.S. U.S. is a superpower, our trading partner. The most powerful expatriate Pakistani community is the Pakistani American community. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have to have good relationship with them. But, you know, a relationship that, is, that must have dignity and respect. Right. Uh, Mr. Imran Khan, as a political leader, how is your relationship today with the West Asia region, with the Arab and Islamic world, especially Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, knowing that you've always played the role of the mediator in fence mending uh, in many turbulent issues among countries in the region? Well, look, you know, we have a, a, a terrible situation in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. um, most of the countries are going through conflict. You know, I mean, you look at the Muslim world, you know, Syria, you know, Afghanistan is just after 40 years, there's, uh, there's peace there. But then, you know, the tensions between the Muslim countries, uh, and, uh, and I feel that, you know, we are lagging so far behind. Uh, the world is leaving us behind, and we are involved in petty conflicts and we can't resolve our differences. You know, you just look all over Somalia, Yemen, all over, you know, there's conflict. And then tensions between, you know, two, oh, Iran is our neighbor, mm -hmm. and Saudi Arabia is one of Pakistan's uh, uh, closest friends. So the tension between them affects us. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and Turkey, I mean, Turkey is a, a powerful country, Muslim country, and then the, there were tensions before, but I'm glad Turkey's tensions are gradually easing with the Middle Eastern countries, and so, I mean, the, the more your tensions disappear, the more you trade between them, the more there will be prosperity, uh, you know, in the Muslim world. Sadly, it is not the case right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So that's true. Pakistan is facing unprecedented economic challenges owing to multiple factors, as you said. Might you tell us how to pull out the country from the current economic quagmire, as you termed it? Do you actually have answers for this dilemma, sir? And are there talks behind the scenes, behind closed doors, about the need for Pakistan to give up its nuclear weapons program in exchange for its economic uh, rescue? Uh, well, the, the way Pakistan will get out of this economic mess is to have justice and rule of law. Mm -hmm. You must remember that countries that have rule of law are prosperous. Countries which have the law of the jungle are, bana are called banana republics, not because of lack of resources, but because they don't have laws. Civil civilizations throughout history prospered, which had relatively better justice system and rule of law. So Islam, when it prospered, and when what is, we call the golden age of Islam, it was when our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, set up the state of Medina based on a justice system of rule of law. Mm -hmm. And it is rule of law that liberated the people. And that's how they became world leaders. Uh, so that is the number one thing in Pakistan. And now when you talk about the second issue, it is worrying all of us because, uh, you know, we have, if there was no threat from a neighbor seven times the size of Pakistan, which is India, mm -hmm. we would not be worrying. I, I'm not very pro nuclear weapons anyway. But the, the fear in Pakistan is that at the time in India, there is an extremist, a racist government in power with a with an extremist ideology. And so therefore there is a worry that if it's seven times the size of Pakistan, if we do not have the protection of a nuclear cover, Pakistan's security would be at stake. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I don't know what is happening behind the scenes, but you know, if a uh, worry is that if you're economically bankrupt, then um, there would be a pressure for us uh, you know, to uh, 
to give, give up our nuclear weapons. And this has been a worry of Pakistanis for a long time mm -hmm. because of the insecurity bred by a neighbor seven times the size of Pakistan. You have announced recently that uh, you have forgiven everyone, including those who attempted to take uh, your life in Wazirabad last year for the sake of the country and the journey towards real independence or fighting for the haqiqi azadi or true freedom. What is your strategy, Mr. Khan, in this sense? Though some might argue, well, uh, you have burnt all your boats with major decisive elements in Pakistani politics, on top of which the military establishment. Well, let me, let me clarify first of all. The military establishment is one man, the army chief. Mm -hmm. So let's not uh, bring the military. It's not some democratic organization where there's voting. It's just one man who takes decisions. Now, secondly, uh, it doesn't matter whether there is no one with me because I have the people of Pakistan with me. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the almighty, Today, Tariq and Saf is the biggest political party in Pakistan's history. So therefore, when you have the people with you, you don't need anyone else. Now, the reason why I said I would forgive the ones who, and I know the ones who attempted to kill me, the reason I said I'd forgive them, because it is in line with, uh, with our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the conquest of Makkah. Mm -hmm. He forgave everyone, people who were, who were uh, uh, cruel to them, who had uh, made them leave, the, leave Makkah and migrate to Medina. So he forgave everyone. So therefore, similarly, I mean, it's not about me, it's about my country. So therefore, I can forgive about those who were cruel to me or tried to kill me. But mm -hmm. what I said, I would, you cannot forgive are the ones who have stolen money from the people of Pakistan mm -hmm, who've done mm -hmm. corruption. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can't forgive them because that money belongs to the people of Pakistan. Uh, my last question for you, uh, Mr. Amran Khan, if you review and assess your political approach, have you made many mistakes? Where and what mistakes have you done? And what have you learned? What will you offer to Pakistan if you return to power? Look, I mean, you know, you make all the mistakes all the time. We humans sure. are humans, mm -hmm. different to the angels, because we make mistakes. But sure. successful human beings always learn from their mistakes. So the, the biggest mistake I made was that uh, I, I believed that the ex-army chief, who was then the army chief when I was in, a prime minister, I believed that he was working for the same for Pakistan just like I was. I felt that his interest and mine were aligned. And so I trusted him completely. And I actually I gave him an extension. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that he was actually, uh, you know, not with me. He was working for these crooks. And these are the crooks. He did a conspiracy to remove me and bring them back again. Mm -hmm. So it's made me understand that, uh, you know, sometimes it's, I was, I've always been a trusting guy. I, I trust people. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I, the mistake I made was I thought his and my objective were the same. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, uh, uh, it was a big mistake to trust him completely. And, and he brought this country now to its knees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the biggest lesson. Uh, and, and secondly, never compromise on the rule of law. Because I, you know, because I, I did not have enough power. As a prime minister, I did not have the accountability bureau. I just wasn't, it was a coalition government, a weak government. I, I did not have the power I needed to impose the rule of law. So I would never take, so the lesson is, I would never take power again, if it, uh, or, or form government again, if I did not have the power to impose rule of law in Pakistan. Excellent, uh, Amran Khan, former Premier of Pakistan, definitely a man of consequence. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us from the Pakistani city of Lahore. Definitely 
uh, and definitely also for your uh, uh, transparency. Few pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. لعل تصريحات عمران خان في فيلم وثائقي تم تصويره أثناء توليه منصبه مثلت برأيه سببا من أسباب استبعاده في الوقت الذي تدعي فيه الدول الغربية أنها تتخذ إجراءات صارمة ضد الأموال القذرة والأوليغارشية قال خان إن الغرب الجماعية سعى إلى سلب موارد الجنوب العالمي وخلافا للرأي العام ليس لدى الغرب أي نية أو حافز لوضع حد للفساد في جميع أنحاء جنوب الكرة الأرضية بل يعمل لتأجيجه وقال عن السلطات البريطانية إنهم يستفيدون من مليارات الدولارات المسروقة من هذا البلد والتي تصب في أعمالهم التجارية وممتلكاتهم لكن هل سيكون لدى عمران خان إذا ما عاد إلى السلطة الحافز والبأس والجرأة لتغيير هذا الواقع المرير من الميادين في مالا